Oh, and hello, James. What lovely, doesn't he have lovely big hands, everyone? <laughs> That's quite an odd thing to hear on a Saturday afternoon. But well, you see, as they come towards the camera, they begin to look bigger and bigger. Oh, <laughs> very true, um, very true. Uh, so yes, um, it's good to see you again, James. Uh, have you had a nice weekend so far? I have. Yeah, I'm um, sort of happy. It's not uh, excruciatingly humid today, so that's quite nice. That's it is an improvement. I've had um, I've had some men in to move around all my books today, which I'm very grateful someone else did. Um, they're very heavy and inconvenient. Not uh, not the kind of thing I'd want to do myself. <laughs> um, speaking of. Actually, no, I haven't got a link at all. Um, so this week, um, we're going to be talking a little bit about the uh, Cambridge SAQ, the Supplementary Application Questionnaire, um, which I believe is now called the Additional Personal Statement, um, which has the great selling point of being a much clearer name. Um, so we've been talking about that a little bit this week. Um, and next week, we'll be coming around to talk about... Um, going about picking uh, what college at Oxford or Cambridge you're planning to apply to, um, which is an an, in, an interesting area. Um, there's some some, fu some fun little bits of data that we can look forward to there. Um, and so that's your your tease for next week. So to make sure that you all turn up um, and invite your friends and all that, all that sort of thing. Um, for those of you who haven't been to one of these before, um, my name is Matt. I look after the research team here at Uni Admissions, and so my job is to make sure that everything that we put forward in these webinars, in our resources, across the board, is stuff that we can back up with data through Microsoft Excel or, or whatever, as um, really working and really having an impact on the quality of your application. Um, I exist mostly in the background. People don't normally see very much of me. Um, but if you are looking to get in direct contact with someone, then I believe, James, you're their man. Yes, uh, hi guys. Um, my name's James. So I'm a, an admissions consultant uh, at Uni Admissions. So I essentially kind of have conversations with parents and students, you know, explore the applications a little bit further and see if we can, you know, action some kind of effective preparation really to, you know, maximize students' chances of, of getting offers. Um, so I have lots and lots of conversations and very much in the foreground, I would say. I'll be seeing, you'll be seeing more of James than you will of me. Um, so um, let's talk a little bit about the um, SAQ then. Um, we're going to run through what it is. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about how to go about writing one. And we're going to th go through some examples. Um, this is probably going to run a little bit shorter than we normally do with our presentations today. Um, we went... I think just over an hour on personal statements a couple of weeks ago. And the personal statement is, I think, 4,000 characters. The SAQ is 1,200 characters. So just under a third of the length of the um, personal personal statement. So we're going to be aiming for a, maybe for a similar sort of ratio today. Um, that, God, that makes me sound like a nerd, doesn't it? Uh, <laughs> oh, well. Um, so to start off with, what um, what is the the SAQ? Um, it gets referred to now as the additional personal statement. I'm kind of going to use the two terms interchangeably. Um, so don't worry about it if you know it as the additional personal statement. Um, but this is essentially an extra form um, that's part of your application to Cambridge. Um, you get an extra week to complete this after the application deadline. Um, so if you send in your personal statement and all those things on the 15th, on the last possible day, you get an extra week, so through until the 22nd of October to send that in. Now, as always, we recommend not waiting until the last possible minute. Um, if you are finished, it's always a good idea to actually finish, is my philosophy on these things. Um, if you have done everything by the 30th of September, just get rid of it, move on with your life. Um, you would be surprised by how distracting students find it, waiting and waiting and waiting to send these things off. Um, waiting until the last day, you never really get to relax about it. And the same thing goes for the um, additional personal statement. Ideally, you want to be doing it alongside the personal statement so that you can send everything off well in time so that you can completely switch focus over to the admissions test when the time comes because it's it's very tempting, very easy to sort of delay that until you finish with this. And that isn't, isn't a great strategy. Um, 
So this is something that only Cambridge is going to see. None of the other universities you apply to are going to take a look at your um, additional personal statement. Um, and so it offers um, a few different opportunities in terms of presenting yourself to what you can do in the personal statement. We had a lot less space, um, but knowing most of the students I've spoken with, really, you don't want any more space. The personal statement is, is stressful enough, so they haven't given you too big an extension. Um, so why does it exist is the question here, because, you know, it's just Cambridge. Um, Oxford don't have one, nowhere else has one. Um, so the, the purpose of it really is to give the admission students at Cambridge a little bit more information to work with, to really understand why you are specifically interested in Cambridge and particularly the details of the course, um, as opposed to somewhere else. So if you are um, applying for a subject that is uh, one, one of the sort of joint subjects, combined subjects, however you want to think of them. So if you're applying for, say, um, uh, human, social and political sciences at Cambridge, but everywhere else you're applying for politics, this is a really good chance for you to talk about your interest in sociology or anthropology or social science and the parts that aren't relevant to those other courses you're applying for. At the same time, if you're applying for um, something that you literally can't get anywhere else, I'm thinking of Anglo-Saxon, Norse and Celtic. We only ever had one student who wanted to help with that, but it does happen. Um, this gives you the opportunity to really talk about that subject in detail when you're probably going to be applying for something else at every other university. And so you're going to have difficulty kind of balancing that out properly in your personal statement. Um, it's also, and we're going to talk about this a little bit next week, um, when we're talking about college choice. Um, it's always very difficult to tell if what we're looking at is causation or correlation with some of the things that we find in the data about admissions. But the additional personal statement is an opportunity for you to write something or to not write something. Um, and so if you don't write anything, which the universities will tell you is absolutely fine, um, and that's also a choice that is extra space that you haven't taken up to make a case for yourself. And it gives the university, you know, they are absolutely clear that it doesn't matter either way. But if you're going to use it, you can use it to give yourself an advantage, to give yourself a little bit of an edge. And if you use it badly, and we're going to come on to this when we come to the examples, it can reinforce a negative impression from the personal statement, or it might just be kind of you know, just aesthetically annoying, something they don't particularly appreciate. You may not harm your chances, but you are missing out on an opportunity to improve them somewhat. Um, so what makes a good one? Um, we've talked a little bit there about what it, what it sort of is. Um, so a good one, the first thing to do is to remember that only Cambridge are going to look at this. Um, if we're applying to UCL, to Durham, to St Andrews, all of these other places, they're not going to see this. They're probably going to guess that you've applied to Oxford or Cambridge because of your um, application going in for the Oxbridge and Medicine deadline in the middle of October rather than the classic deadline later in the year. Um, but they're not going to know for certain. And um, they're not going to see any of this additional information you've sent over to Cambridge. So if you are really fixed on the idea of Cambridge, if you're really not that interested in some of the other um, universities you applied for, this is your chance to focus on the Cambridge stuff. You don't want to put that in your main personal statement because it might upset the other universities. It's a, it's a little bit rude, right? You know, if you were, I don't know, if, they, if, if there was more than one, more than one person you were interested in going on a date with, you wouldn't tell them, you wouldn't tell which one was your, tell one of them they were second choice. Um, they, you know, you might like them almost as much. But uh, that, that sort of ranking tends not to go down well with people. So anything that you want to talk about Cambridge specific, I would I would save it for the additional personal statement. Um, I would be, I would urge you to really focus on the aspects of the course that work for you. Um, and this is a fairly simple piece of research to do, you know, you know what subject you're applying for, go and get the, co the course syllabus from the website, look at the different themes, the different books, different aspects of, of the subject that you're going to be looking at, figure out what's really interesting to you in that, and then you, know, you want to reflect on that over the course of 100 or so words. Really think about why 
you want to do this course in this place and ground that in the course itself rather than in kind of vaguer ideas. And that's something we're going we to talk about in a second. Um, the other thing to say is, remember, it is optional. Um, I was speaking with an admissions tutor at uh, Cambridge College um, only a few weeks ago, and they said that something like only two thirds of the students that they had accepted um, for law last year uh, wrote anything in the additional personal statement, um, and that they had essentially no one who had filled the whole character limit. Um, so don't don't feel like you need to fill it up. If you've run out of things to say, then that's fine. Um, much better to be concise than to go on and on because you've got the space and you don't want to waste it. Um, yeah, you don't want to be in a position where you are filling out your filling filling out with with waffle with things that aren't relevant that perhaps show um, you in a in a poorer light, perhaps show that your writing isn't as as good as it could be. You know, keep it clear and concise and focused. Um, it may be that you don't have 1200 characters worth of things to say and that's absolutely fine um you know you could you could quite possibly put in a perfectly successful application where in the additional personal statement but you just said thank you for reading it's not what i would go for but it's polite and that's you know, that's something who doesn't like a little bit of politeness um we talked earlier about uh, mixed subjects um this is where you want to talk about that extra part, the part that isn't necessarily being covered in the other universities you're going to. So if you're applying for natural sciences um, uh, and going for the kind of biological side of that, and this is where you want to be talking about chemistry, um, the parts of that syllabus that aren't the part that cross over with your other subject choices. This is the same as we mentioned for um, HSPS, um, and to an extent for land economy, because it's such an odd mixed subject with the mix of law and economics and, um, uh, sort of, I'm trying to think, well, what else? there's all sorts of things in Landec, um, and particularly relevant for, for ASNAC, but I would, I would be surprised if we hadn't applied that it's a, a fairly unusual one. Um, now, you also want to avoid making mistakes. Um, I think that's key in life, as it is in writing the SAQ. Um, the first mistake people will make is they will talk a lot about the college uh, that they've applied to. Now, the way that the sort of sorting system for applicants works is um, most applicants will select a college they prefer um, and put that on their application. Some applicants will say they don't mind and put in what's called an open application. Um, now, inevitably, some colleges, the older, fancier, um, they tend to be more popular. And so they will have more um applicants per place than some other colleges so it might be that at say trinity they're getting six applicants per place but up the road at fitzwilliam they're only getting three applicants per place so what will then happen is the university will shuffle around the applicants so that each college is um interviewing a number of students that is proportionate to the number of places they have available so that um, you don't have Trinity interviewing 600 students for 100 places while FITS are interviewing 300 students for 100 places. That would be dreadfully unfair. Um, because in that case, you would be being disadvantaged, not by your choice, but by having chosen something popular, which is determined by other people's choices. And it all becomes, all becomes a little confusing. So don't worry about talking about the college you've picked. Um, it may change. And that's nothing to worry about. Um, college choice is an interesting part of the process, but it's not worth um, really getting into the details of why you want to go to a particular college, um, particularly not in this in this context. The other thing to say is you don't want to just recap your personal statement. Um, you know, if you've talked about a certain set of books, a certain set of ideas, don't come back to them now unless you're coming back to them perhaps to have a make a really detailed precise point about the way that your interests overlap with the um the cambridge course you want to be bringing new information that's cambridge specific because you know if you think about the the format almost that the person who reads this is going to experience it in they're going to have your personal statement in one hand and they're going to have the saq in the other hand and they're going to read them one after the other so if that if you're repeating yourself that's not going to be especially interesting reading um, so you want to avoid that if you possibly can. 
the um, last thing to say here is also, you don't want to get um, distracted by sort of doing talking about prestige. We're going to look at an example of this in a moment. Um, focus on the course. People know that you want to go to Cambridge. That's why you're applying to Cambridge. That's fine. You don't need to justify it through flattery or going on about how great the university is. Either the people there know that and don't care, or they are, yeah, they will read that and they think, oh, he doesn't want to go here for the um, for the things that we're going to teach him. He wants to go here so that he can say he had gone here. You know, you want to make sure that the impression you're giving is that you want to go there to study and to learn to work hard, not to spend the rest of your life trading off how you've done something, whether you worked hard at it or not. That's the, the thing you really want to avoid. Um, so let's have a look at some examples. I was right, this is going to run short today. So we'll have, lots, oh. we'll have um, lots of time for questions, which is nice. Um, so please do drop those into the uh, Q&A section. I can see there's already two in there. Um, please do drop those in. And we will get to a whole bunch of those after this. Um, I'm just, um, sorry to interrupt, Matt. I just, yeah. what I would say is just to echo what you said, really, is that if you do have an extra opportunity to sort of sell yourself as an applicant, why wouldn't you ultimately? You know, the caveat being you have to do it well. You have to write a good, you know, SAQ. But if you can, then you know, why wouldn't you do it? That's my sort of perspective on things. And similarly to if anybody attended personal statement uh, open day, we did. We were talking about really kind of generic sort of buzzwords and things. I'm sure we're probably going to see them soon. You've really got to try and avoid using those really sort of horrible generic things like, you know, I want to go to Cambridge because it's historic. You know, that, that sort of thing is just awful because, you know, it's, well, I think everybody can work out why it's, it's not ideal. So, yeah, rather than focusing on the college, focus on the course and focus on why you think you are a suitable candidate for the course as well. Supported by you know, things you've done, things you've read. You can elaborate on kind of any specific Cambridge related events or things that you've done. You've done master classes or gone to Cambridge Open Days. You can sort of talk about those things as well. Um, try and make it really specific rather than just some kind of generic, um, yeah, compliments to the university. Sorry, I just thought I'd a pitch in there. It's it's almost as if you've read the slides, James, because that's coming up. Oh, uh, right. oh well, there you go. Okay. <laughs> and well, I've it's logical get... then. Logical and advice. Prom- and I can promise you, audience, he hasn't read the slides because I didn't. I I didn't send them to him. So unless he's been doing a lot of very careful research behind the scenes. Um, so yes, um, we'll have a look at some examples. So um, we can start off with a, um, a pretty good one. I quite like this one. Um, so this applicant writes, I'm attracted to the Cambridge course for a variety of reasons. I'm particularly interested in linguistics and the impact of language on culture rather than solely literature. For example, as I researched the details of the Russian course at Cambridge, I was impressed by the possibility of studying grammar through a comprehensive training system, including register syntax and idioms. I also welcome the opportunity of having access to a non-standard Russian class where an authentic manner of Russian speech is taught. So I say, James, what what do you like about this one? Yeah, so it's it's quite specific, isn't it? It's not sort of generic and talking about something specific to the Cambridge course itself. Um, You know, I don't know too much about how Russian is taught elsewhere, but uh, obviously there's a big focus on the sort of grammar and things uh, in Cambridge. So, yeah, it's just a lot more specific, isn't it? And citing uh, that comprehensive training system, I perhaps, is that something that's pulled from the the actual course outline, is it? I would would expect so. Yeah, so that's quite nice. Um, Yeah, it's just got an example as well, actually, as simple as that is. If you've got to say something, back it up with an actual example. Yeah. And the the way that it draws the very clear line between... I'm interested in this, and here is the example of what in the course appeals to me about that. So if you're interested in the way that language, and particularly if we're thinking linguistics, kind of the structure of language, how that influences culture beyond just literature, so, you know, normal people culture, tying that up here to the non-standard Russian 
is a really good example of that, where what you're interested in isn't just, um, you know, Tolstoy or whatever, but you're interested in what, you know, normal Russian people are doing these days, what actual spoken Russian is like. And spotting the value in that is really helpful as well, because I can, I can imagine that if you were to only study, you know, 19th century Russian, and then you were to go on your, you know, your year abroad to, well, I shouldn't imagine many people are going on a year abroad to Russia at the moment, but um, <laughs> to have to have that experience in, you know, having contact with, you know, normal Russian people, I would be surprised if many of those people spoke in the style of, um, of uh, you know, of um, Alexei Karinenkov or uh, or any other character from uh, from Tolstoy or Dostoevsky. I expect they probably have a slightly different, more casual manner of speaking these days. Um, so being prepared for that, spotting that is really a really helpful bit of information. Um, let's have a look at another example. I think there's another one that's all right. Okay, and here we have um, someone talking about a specific experience they've had, and someone has already asked about this in the chat. So this is a really good uh, good example to look at. Um, they write, my fascination with the Cambridge history course came after attending the shadowing scheme in February. During the scheme, I attended a civil rights movement lecture focusing on the idea of reconstruction and exploring the vulnerability of American history that resulted in some of the events that took place in the Jim Crow era. Prior to the lecture, I had only studied civil rights in regards to the different attitudes people held at the time. However, this taught me the importance of looking at history from different perspectives and examining the many different factors that can influence this. It was the deeper insight that initially inspired me to study history. This one I like less. Um, the, the beginning is great. Um, I would always be a little cautious about going, oh, I'm fascinated by it, it's a little tired. Um, but talking about a specific experience you've had with the university is really helpful. Um, and reflecting on it and saying how you have, you know, changed your mind, it's given you a, a sense of a different approach to the subject, that's all good. Unfortunately, what I'm getting in the second paragraph, I'm, ju I'm just not getting very much. Uh, but talk, you know, if you've learned about the importance of looking at something from different perspectives and examining different factors, okay, well, work through the example for me. Tell me what different perspectives, what different attitudes. Tell me what the different factors are. You've gone to the trouble of having a specific example up the top here. I want to hear more about that. You know, is it to do with, um, I, I don't know what, what might be, you know, it is, is the, is the history of Jim Crow, is that to do with, um, economic circumstances? Is it to do with, um, legal situ uh, with the legal situation? Is it to do with, um, cultural problems? Are there sort of political structural problems? You know, give me, give me these new perspectives, like, it's great to tell me that you have encountered a diversity of ideas, but I want to hear what the ideas are. So I'd like some ideas. Do, do you have anything further on this one, James? Uh, the only other thing I said is, I would say, is that the SAQ is good in a sense that you are, you can kind of, only to a limited degree, kind of funnel, you know, the, the sort of questioning within your interview, because undoubtedly, you would imagine that you know if you're writing very specifically about you know a book that you've read or something that you've attended or specific interest that you're probably going to therefore be asked to elaborate on that a little bit more in your interview so that's a positive thing because you can sort of funnel things a little bit towards your areas of interest but the caveat being if you're going to talk about um you know the civil rights movement lecture you have to be prepared to be able to have an in-depth conversation about that in the interview. Similarly with the personal statement, don't ever mention anything just because you think it sounds good or you've got a general interest in it and not feel comfortable to engage in an in-depth discussion around it because you'll look a little bit silly in the interview. This this actually happened to me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, and this was... Four, nearly 15 years ago? God, I feel old. Um, I was applying to study classics at Oxford, um, and I had written in my personal statement that I had read uh, Ovid's Ars Amatoria, um, and I hadn't read it. Uh, so what I did was I read it at the last possible minute, having bought a copy while I was in Oxford for the interview that was the next day. 
And of course, they never brought it up in my interview. Um, but the sense of panic, the reading the book at the last minute, that didn't help my interview preparation. And if they had asked me about the book, would I have had anything good to say? I guess it would have been fresh in my mind, but it would also have... I would not have had time to reflect on it. It wouldn't really, I wouldn't really have sat with it. So I think e either way, it was a bit of a mistake. I would say, you know, again, if you're going to engage with an idea, if you're going to bring it up, you should only bring something up that you genuinely want to talk about. Um, if you bring up something you don't want to talk about, there is the risk that they will want to talk about it and you will, you will look silly. Um, and you want to avoid that because even if it doesn't turn out to be an important part of the interview, it's going to throw you off. It's going to make you feel uncomfortable. You may, it's going to let, it's going to impact your confidence. All sorts of things. They're going to be unhelpful, even if it doesn't turn out to be an enormous part of your score. Um, so we're going to look at a bad example next. Um, this is why I never put the names of the people who write these on, uh, wow. because sometimes uh, I say that they're bad. Um, and this is this one I don't like. Um, so this person writes. Cambridge has been ranked amongst the very best in physical natural sciences by many reputable world university ranking bodies. This speaks volumes about the education and research quality at Cambridge. Many Nobel Prizes in chemistry have been awarded to Cambridge affiliates since 1904, 24 in total, with six recipients since the turn of this century alone, the most recent one being in 2017. This reflects the depth and relevance of the Cambridge course and its impact to the world. I aspire to be an accomplished and outstanding research chemist, standing out among peers, and making significant contributions to the world. Now, uh, I, 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 I don't think I'm going to need to tell you what I don't like about this one, James. Yeah, I mean, oh dear, is my initial reaction. I mean, that looks like it's been copied and pasted off Wikipedia, doesn't it? At least the first two paragraphs. That is exactly what I was about to say. <laughs> yes, there is, um, there is an English expression where we say that you shouldn't teach your grandmother to suck eggs. Um, which essentially means if somebody already knows how to do something, you shouldn't tell them how to do it. And this is very much, I hear you work at Cambridge University. Have you heard of Cambridge University? Um, so here the student is explaining what Cambridge University is to someone who already works there. Um, explaining to them the Nobel Prize, which they probably already know about. None of this is interesting. The person who is reading it already knows all this stuff. And so they're not impressed. What, what this tells me is that the person who is writing it wants to be a chemist, and that's great, but mostly they want to be a big deal and to win a Nobel Prize and all that sort of thing. Now, generally speaking, if you want to succeed in life, it's best to be motivated by the thing you're doing rather than the prize you might get at the end of it. Um, if you go into life want, with your ambition being to win a Nobel Prize, Chances are you will be disappointed. Not that many people win them. Um, and by framing their ambition this way, they made it look like they're really only interested in Cambridge because of the prestige of the place rather than the actual content of the course. Because there's nothing here about the content of the course. It says, does it, does it mention it? This reflects the depth and relevance of the Cambridge course. Well, first of all, it doesn't. The whether people win the Nobel Prize or not isn't really related to what the undergraduate course in chemistry is like. Um, probably not related at all. So that link doesn't really make any sense. And then you haven't talked about the course you're applying to. You've talked about how fancy everyone who's already there is, which is nice, but I'm sure they know that. This is, yeah, this is exactly what you want to avoid. There's nothing of the person writing the, the statement in here. I don't know anything new about them. And they've given me a little excerpt from Wikipedia, which is handy, but I could have looked up. Um, I haven't actually stuck this through Google to see if it is literally taken from Wikipedia. Um, I expect they've rewritten it, but I wouldn't be shocked. Um, so this is this is exactly what you want to avoid. There's no personality. There's no detail. There's no sense of why they want to do the course. There's just flattering the person who's reading it, who probably isn't that impressed. And, you know, worst case, the person who's reading it, maybe they haven't won a Nobel Prize, but they feel they should have done. Maybe they're, maybe one of their colleagues who they don't like has won a Nobel Prize. Maybe this will upset them. Um, I think it's unlikely, but, you know, you haven't given me anything else to work with here. All you do is talk about the, the Nobel Prize. 
Um, it's it's entirely off topic. Do you know Do you know the origins of the of the Nobel Prize, uh, James? Oh, I, I don't. I don't. Uh, so this is this is this is a very funny little, little anecdote. So the um, the guy who came up with it, Alfred Nobel, uh, he he invented dynamite. Um, and so he in the 19th century, and so he was very, very rich and successful, uh, having invented dynamite. Um, and uh, one day in, I think, something like 1880, uh, in the late 1890s, his brother died. And the newspaper in the city he lived in accidentally printed the obituary they had prepared for Alfred rather than for his brother. And the obituary was all about what a horrible person Alfred Nobel was and how he had caused all sorts of problems by inventing dynamite and... Um, essentially just saying that he wasn't a very nice bloke. And Alfred read this and went, oh God, this is what everyone thinks about me. Um, and so he invented the Nobel Prize. And now that's the only people, thing people know about him. So be very successful in that then. Yeah. Absolutely. So he, it, was, it was in the first instance an attempt by, by Alfred Nobel to rebrand himself as a kind of philanthropist, having realized that he was not popular for having invented dynamite. Interesting. Fab. Um, that brings me to the end of my slides. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand over to you, James, to talk in a little bit more detail about the support that we offer here at Uni Admissions. And while you do that, I'm going to fact check my Alfred Nobel story, because I have a horrible feeling it might not be true now I've told it. Uh, <laughs> we're all going to go away with that as, as pure fact now, Matt. So I'm we're going to be I'm responsible for many people learning wrong information going forward. No, that's why, that's why I'm going to go and fact check, because... I have, a, as I say, I have a horrible feeling that it's not true because it's too good a story. <laughs> <laughs> Fab. All right. Um, over to you, James. Tell us about the, the programmes that we offer. Sure. So, yes, guys, I think most of you are aware um, that we are a prep school. So that's what we do. We support students applying to study at Oxford and Cambridge University. And we have programmes of support to help students prepare effectively and ultimately you know maximize your chances of getting an offer uh, what we like to do is actually speak to students you know, individually find out about your applications what you've done so far in your preparation what kind of support you're getting you know lots and lots of information then potentially recommend some kind of program of support to you uh, a programme typically has a number of sort of uh, parts to it, which I'm just going to quickly go through now, um, just to give you a sense of the structure. And I don't know if Matt, if you're in the background moving these slides, but the, the first uh, the first part of a programme typically is one-to-one -one tuition. So if you were applying for you know, natural sciences, biological at Cambridge, you'd be working with a tutor who themselves studies natural sciences, biological at Cambridge. So the idea is to work with a tutor who's been through the same process as you successfully, and then work with them to you know, um, improve and you know, uh, practice towards your personal statement, your, your test, your interview, whatever it may be. Part of that is guidance and advice though. So in terms of college selection, in terms of how to complete the SAQ, you know, all of those other um, factors that are involved in an application that's part of the support but yes one-to-one -one tuition is the first part um, alongside one-to-one -one tuition we have resources so we've been doing this a long time we published just over 100 books for the Oxbridge applications now a lot of award-winning books for the sort of test interview processes etc and we actually have a student portal the whole idea of this is structure. So the, prop, the, the sort of mistake I would say a lot of students make each year is that they don't really have any structure in the way that they prepare. They don't really do enough because they don't really understand what to do or to overcompensate for not having structure. They don't really, uh, so they do sort of too much, not really very effectively. So on the student portal, you work through a very structured curriculum towards the personal statement towards your admissions test towards the interview so it's really structured um so there's an enormous amount of resources you know, question banks um, academies all of that sort of stuff thirdly we have, we have a weekly enrichment seminar so everybody knows that when you're applying to oxford and cambridge you need to read a lot 
you know, everybody knows that. Everybody knows that you need to kind of go away and do sort of research and all of these things. But actually, you're not being assessed on what you've done. You're being assessed on your ability to reflect on and to discuss what you've done in the context of applying to the university. So it's something that makes an enormous difference to a student in their interview. They'll have read lots. They'll have lots of sort of internal conversations about the topics that they like. They'll never have practiced discussing it. And then they'll fall short in their interview because, of course, when you try and do something for the first time, you're never going to be as polished as when you've done it multiple times. So every every week, uh, every Sunday, we have enrichment seminars for kind of each sort of subject area where you're meeting with other applicants and our lead tutors and we're looking at different key topics within the subject each week. We're building the kind of confidence and competence of being able to discuss those topics in the same way you'll be expected to do in your interview. So those are the weekly seminars. And then finally, we have some courses as well. So sort of close to the personal statement, close to the uh, test, close to the interviews, we have a kind of intensive course, which essentially just consolidates the preparation that you've been doing. So kind of making sure you're really ready and it's that final springboard into each stage of the application. So yes, that, that's typically a program um, and hopefully you can see it's pretty, pretty comprehensive. Fab, um, thank you, James. The good news, it all seems to work. Um, we're really proud of our success rates, which are well ahead of the national average. Um, and we're hoping to get perhaps our 500th um, successful application um, in this year. Um, our results also compare really flatteringly with some of the best schools in the country. Um, sadly, we don't have as snazzy the, as outfits as they do over at Eton, um, but we do do similarly well, even without the outfits. Um, a source of disappointment to me, I think not so much to Rohan, not really his style. Um, um, I'd also ask if you have enjoyed this webinar or any of the others, um, please do say something nice about me, particularly on Trustpilot. Mention how handsome I am, how tall, how athletic, um, which admittedly you can't see from this angle, but I promise it's true. Um, and I will include your review in every one of these uh, presentations going forward, um, because while flattery will not work on Cambridge, telling them how many Nobel Prizes they've won, it will absolutely work on me. If you'd like to suggest that I should win the Nobel Prize for Zoom, which I'm sure exists, um, then that's that's the kind of thing that will absolutely get you into one of these presentations. Um, you can also uh, listen to our podcast, um, which is put together by uh, our founder, Rohan, and my colleague, Will, where they discuss everything from um, getting you from your uh, additional personal statement all the way through to a zombie apocalypse, which I believe they discussed a couple of months back in a, a slightly more lighthearted episode. Um, and finally, we're going to take some questions. And as we do that, hopefully, uh, this fun little animation is going to play, um, showing you how to get in touch with us so that you can speak to James or one of his colleagues um, about how we can help. Um, this uh, will show you how to book a consultation. These are completely fee-free, commitment-free, um, uh, 15, 20, 30 minute conversation with us that allows us to figure out what you need, whether we can help with it, um, and to begin the process of um, working out how we can we can work together if that's what everyone involved decides to do. Um, so let's have a look at some questions. Um, uh, Avni asks about um, mentioning co uh, colleges or courses. So I think we just got, I'll just recap from this this from the slides. Um, our advice is that you should really focus on the course rather than the college when you're filling out the SAQ. This is because there is a good chance that you won't um, necessarily end up at or even be interviewed by the college you pick, particularly if you've picked one of the more popular colleges, a King's or a Trinity. Um, so it's worth just sticking to the course. The course will be pretty much the same whichever college you go to, and the course should be the thing you really care about. Um, so I would focus on that. It's also the case that it's very difficult to say anything interesting about the colleges in my experience. Um, 
you can try, but all you're ever really going to be able to come up with is saying that you like someone who works there or that they have a nice student bar or that the architecture is nice. It's it's hard to come up with anything really concrete to talk about. And so I tend, I would generally avo- uh, say to avoid it in the personal statement because you're not, particularly if you want to go there because a famous person used to go there, that's uh, really a no-no. Um, it's not a very good reason. They're not going to be there, are they? You know, if I, when I applied to Oxford, one of the reasons I chose my college was because Oscar Wilde went there. Now, Oscar Wilde had, even at that point, been dead for 100 years. He wasn't there. He, he was dead in France. So he wasn't really, it didn't really make sense as a lure, really. But it was something that preoccupied me. And, you know, I'm not sure it did my application any good. Um, we have a question about a coming into a medicine masterclass. Um, yes. So if you've attended an event at a particular college, um, then absolutely mention the college because it's helpful context for the person reading it to know, ah, I know what event that is. Um, and it gives you a chance to reflect on the event in more detail. Um, and the question of work experience. So your work experience should be going in the main personal statement um, because that is relevant to every university you're applying to. For the SAQ, you want to be sticking to the stuff that is really Cambridge specific. Um, the stuff that other universities won't necessarily be interested in or, you know, just adding a little bit extra about the course. Um, think of it as, yeah, think of it as being the bit that is Cambridge specific in your in your application. Um, Let's have a look. Um, Alexandru asks about past recordings. James, how do people get access to past recordings? Uh, so I believe, I mean, we have a YouTube channel where we have all of the past recordings and we, we really have covered pretty much everything related to Oxbridge. So there's a lot of really, really uh, interesting info there. I believe if you go on the website and kind of uh, where you've registered for this if you did it through the website you can view past recordings there uh, but they are almost also emails so this recording will be emailed to everybody uh, here probably on wednesday and then within that email i believe you can access the old ones is that right matt yeah that sounds about right to me from my recollection that there are loads um so I would say, in terms of your preparation, I would say, number one, study for your admissions test. Number two, make sure your personal statement is good. And number three, listen to loads of these. Mm. Um, <laughs> but there are, as far as I can tell, literally hundreds of hours of me talking. Um, I wouldn't recommend that to anyone. Um, but if you would like to, they are there. Um, so you should get a link after this, and they are normally floating around afterwards as well. Think about how many uh, interesting historical stories they'll hear though, and learn oh. about. Thank you for reminding me. So I looked it up and it is true. Oh, okay. In fact, um, I've, I've got a wonderful little quote here, um, which is that when they accidentally reported uh, Alfred Nobel as dead in 1888, um, here is the um, obituary that was written. The headline was Le Marchand de la Mort et Mort, which um, is French and translates to The Merchant of Death is Dead. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Uh, oh, yeah. the, the obituary went on to say, Dr. Alfred Nobel, who became rich by finding ways to kill more people faster than ever before, died yesterday. Oh, it didn't mince their words then, did they? No, so you can see why he was upset. <laughs> but there you go. I, I, I'm pleasantly surprised that turned out to be true. I was worried it wouldn't be true at all. But it uh, appears completely true. How, how exciting. Um, let us carry on. Um, Atul asks about using particular names of papers or sticking to topic names. Um, so I would look at this in the context of your word count. If you're going to be citing a paper that has a really long name, um, then I would avoid that because you're going to end up using all the space you wanted to talk about the, um, the paper than um, you wanted to, you know, You'll be using all, all that space for the title rather than talking about it. So if it's something that's already mentioned elsewhere in your personal statement, something like um, uh, A-level content or A-level books, you don't need to worry about bringing those up again because people know you've studied them. Um, but I would broadly speaking stick to topic names rather than titles if it's going to save you some space. Because what you don't want to do is use up half your personal statement um, putting in names rather than actually doing any work. 
Um, so I would say, yeah, you want to focus on what's interesting you, on your ideas, not just name dropping, and particularly if those names are really long. Um, fab. Um, I had a question about whether we're gonna be talking about classics. Um, so at classics is what I applied for unsuccessfully all those years ago. Um, I will probably, I will make sure that we focus a little bit more on that in the next couple of weeks. Um, but I would say that classics is one where I would worry a little bit less about the SAQ um, because you'll probably be applying to classics at a whole range of universities. But I would emphasize in there why you're picking Cambridge in particular. So have a look at the differences between the Cam classics course at Cambridge and at Oxford or at UCL or at King's. Um, and really, really focusing on what about the Cambridge approach to it that is interesting to you. Um, for the SAQ, but th th thankfully for classics, that's a fairly wi widely available one, so you don't have to worry too much about that in the context of um, working out your, your personal statement. Um, Bennett asks, um, writing about super, essentially using the SAQ as a kind of an overflow from the main personal statement. Uh, what, what do you make of that, James? Well, uh, if you follow the rules that we've we've talked about today, making it kind of specific, then you know potentially that would be that would be fine. Um, you can't write an exhaustive list of everything that you've done. You know, you just you wouldn't have space to put that anywhere. So I wouldn't do it just because you think, oh, well, I didn't get a chance to do it my personal statements. So I'll pop it in the SAQ. Only write about it if it's really relevant. If you've got something really um, you know interesting. To, to say with regards to it, then I would say yes. Um, what would you say, Matt? Yeah, I think if it's really good and really interesting and really relevant, it should already be in your personal statement. Um, if it links into a specific aspect of the course that you can draw a really good um, link there with that, then I think that's a really good use of the SAQ because you're going to be talking about a specific project that you've worked on that has linked up with something that you're planning to study at Cambridge. I think that could work really well. But if it's um, if it's a piece of work you've done that's really interesting and you've left out of your personal statement, then I'll be asking why and whether you can sneak it in, particularly if you've got a, lo a long paragraph in your personal statement about how much you love rugby, because that you can do without, as we talked about in our personal statement presentation a couple of weeks ago, which I would encourage everyone to go back and look at, uh, because it was over an hour long. I had a lot of talking. It took me ages to do the slides. Uh, so go, go watch that one. It's, it's dead good. Um, there we go. Uh, Doreen asks about um, uh, linking up sort of sort of big picture ideas, kind of strat. Um, she says, um, "Yeah, um, yeah." So I'm not doing this wrong. I would really shy away from being too vague when it comes to transferable skills. So the thing that annoys me most, I find in personal statements is where people will draw a link between two things that doesn't really make sense. Um, so someone will say, I have learned to be, you know, very determined and hardworking because of how much swimming I do. <sighs> have you? Really? Maybe? It's not, it's not really relevant. And you're, it just doesn't, it, do, it doesn't fill me with confidence in your powers of reasoning basically. Um, if you're going to talk about things outside of school, then there needs to be a really clear academic link, a link to just say, you know, I kn I've heard that um, if I want to be a chemist, I'll have to learn some complicated techniques like the butterfly stroke. Not convincing. Um, it's sort of, it, it doesn't work. The link, it doesn't fit together. There isn't really a transferable skill at work. And it just it just looks silly. So I would be be careful about that. You want to be grounding things in real examples, real clear lines of reasoning. And I think you're planning on um, uh, planning on applying for law. You know that's not that's not the kind of reasoning that stands up in court. Unfortunately, you're going to want something a little bit stronger than that. Um, Uh, yes, and yeah, again, talking about um, different events. If you've been up and spent time at Cambridge or Oxford or whatever, absolutely talk about how it um, uh, how it motivated your interest in the course. And in the SAQ, you can talk about how it motivated your interest in the university. But at every point, you want to be emphasising the course, what you're going to be learning, not the nice buildings or the 
student bar or the place that you know the college that does your laundry for you rather than having to do it yourself you want to be focusing really on the, the reason you're there um got a couple of interesting ones um uh there you go uh, sarah asks about um oh she says that she has heard a rumor that if you send your application in uh L later in the day there's a chance they won't read it that doesn't i i would be astonished that was true um, that, that sounds like a little bit of uh yeah a little bit of a false um yeah story yeah. going around i don't think that's true at all no um i i very very much doubt that what i know from my experience was when i was a, a graduate student at cambridge is that no one looked at the personal statements until after the deadline they literally no one printed them out no one went on the platform um some of the personal statement initial personal statement review was done by phd students and they didn't start on it until the relevant time in the year like no one was looking at them in september i mean particularly for oxford and Cambridge, there won't be anyone there in september um because they don't start till october so i'm i feel fairly confident saying not true doesn't matter when you send it in you'll be given equal consideration. And this goes again for the question about colleges. Um, the universities have put in a lot of effort to make sure that which college you apply for doesn't disadvantage your application. Um, so wherever you apply, you will have an equal chance of getting in. Um, so don't don't worry too much about picking picking colleges on, on that basis. But as I mentioned earlier, we're gonna be talking a, a lot more about colleges next week. So please do come back for that. Um, uh, Kevin Meager asks whether you get seven days to send in your SAQ. Um, if you still only get seven days if you send in your personal statement early. It doesn't look like it from what I've read, um, but I haven't tested the system yet this year by applying myself. Um, so that would be useful to know, but I very much doubt that they put that extra early deadline on. But I would say, because I think of it as all being one part of the same process, I would really advise having them all prepped, all ready to go, and then get it over and done with, so that you can then focus on what you're interested in, in terms of the admissions test, in terms of preparation for that, rather than having this half-finished thing floating around. So I would say getting getting it all done is the way to go for it. Uh, Kauza asks about college. No, you, you, again, don't worry about mentioning colleges, even if that's where the person who you've been reading has gone to. It's it's not especially important. Um, and have you, have you been to a summer school? Does it matter if you, uh, no? If you've been, summer schools, if you've been doing things like that, then it's great to mention it that you've been you know engaging with the subject. You've been putting that time and effort in. Um, no one's going to be upset that you went to a summer school at another university. I mean, say if you went to one in London rather than in Cambridge. I don't know. Maybe it was easier for you to get to London. It's a perfectly good reason. Um, it's about the experience, about how it's informed your interest in the course. The Essentially, all of these questions of names, I wouldn't worry too much about. What we want are ideas and concepts and reflection and motivation. What you want to avoid is having a personal statement that's absolutely stuffed with names. The more names you've got, the, the worse it will be, generally speaking. Um, and is there anything else you wanted to pick up here, James? Or... Um, Shall we call it a day there? Yeah, just a couple of people have asked, you know, is the SAQ relevant for different subjects like computer science, economics? As we said at the beginning, if, if you write, if you have the material to write a good SAQ, then it's a benefit for any subject. But, you know, try and follow the rules that we've been talking about. You know, make it really specific to the course that you're applying to. And then yes, it's relevant to any subject at all. And the same principles apply. So maybe just re-watch this and kind of just make a note of the principles we, we talked about. They're fairly logical principles, but just make sure that you're following them. Yeah, thanks James. Um, and there was one question about um, BMAT and UCAT. That's, ooh, that is an interesting question. Um, if you can, if you get in touch, I don't know if we're already in touch with you. This is uh, from B. Um, this is what I would actually like to have a look, little bit of a look into. Oh, no, already working with us. This is what I'm going to have a look into um, because that is an interesting question about 
um, mentioning the UCAT to BMAT universities. Let me come back to you on that. That is an interesting question. I want to look into that because that is, um, yeah, that's 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 that is interesting from a data standpoint. I think I'll be able to do a graph. Um, fab. Uh -huh. um, well, uh, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Um, thank you particularly to you, James. Um, oh. What of one of my absolute favourite partners for these. Um, and we'll be back talking to you next week about, um, what are we doing next? Oh, choosing a college. That's what we're doing next week. So we'll be back talking to you about that. Um, and who knows, perhaps I will have another, it turns out to be true story about Alfred Nobel or about another famous person. Uh, who else has a prize? Maybe I'll do something about the Fields Medal. Who can say? Um, but yeah, thanks very much, everyone. And goodbye. Yeah, thanks, guys. Bye-bye.